thanks to all the speakers uh, of these uh, sessions. All three speakers have been um, uh, wonderful in um, um, you know, highlighting all the potential risks um, of uh, frozen embryo transfers in different populations. Um, I uh, would like to start uh, um, this discussion session um, by um, asking um, something to the three of you and see your, your opinion. And I think the common theme um, at the end of these two days uh, and very much at the end of this session is that uh, natural cycle of versus HRT cycles, natural cycles is much better in terms of uh, outcomes for the mom and for the babies. However, we all have our life even if we are on Sunday morning here or Sunday evening here watching this interesting masterclass, but we all have a life and um, we all would like to work ideally Monday to Friday, perhaps on Saturday morning. So I'm, I'm just thinking to ask, is there a possibility perhaps to um, uh, pre-plan the natural cycle by, I don't know, giving the pill or giving the noretisterone to some patients so that they can you know, bleed at a certain time and, you know, within a, a certain um, kind of flexibility, we could perhaps um, have them ovulating um, in, in, a, in, a, in a useful time. So that's one question. And the second is to touch on the aspirin that um, uh, Dr. Nandita just uh, mentioned. Perhaps one possibility would be still to stick to the program cycles with the HRT, but maybe gives aspirin to our patients, in particular the ones that are high risk, like the older women. So yeah, if I could ask these, que these two questions, starting with um, um, Sarah, that today she's online, so she can answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I, I hope I hope there will be no internet problem today, uh, like yesterday, but uh, thanks for asking the question because um, I think pre-programming a spontaneous cycle is not always a very easy thing because you essentially want the ovulation to uh, come on such a day that you can transfer the embryo not on the weekend or not on any major holidays, uh, basically whenever you want. And what I was trying to say yesterday, and um, my Zoom did not cooperate, was that uh, I really honestly don't believe that ovulation triggering by ACG in the long run will show as good results as totally spontaneous ovulation. For the pure reason that I think that when a process happens on its own spontaneously, you get the best outcome in terms of implantation, endometrial functioning, and embryo and endometrial synchronizing. So uh, basically, what I think is that you can, well, you can of course do this if nothing else happens. But of course, you can try pre-treatment with contraceptive pills and stop the pills at a suitable moment, or you can do the progestogen, uh, you know, pre-treatment and stop it again in the same way. These are very old classical ways. Uh, of, uh, well, trying to make sure that the ovulation is on the day you want it to be. And that's my answer. I'm very curious what uh, Chris would answer on the same question. I'm really, really curious what the idea would be in the United States and then about Dr. Nandita also, because India also, each country has different practices. They vary a lot. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Discussing the inconvenience, there's no question that this comes up for us practically at every meeting, every week. The nurses don't like it. The patients, I'm not sure, uh, see the difference. So I think it's us, primarily the healthcare providers, who are getting uh, this uh, unpredictability of when this will happen. And even though I do agree, Dr. Verleva, that uh, fully natural cycle may end up proving to be the best, give us the best outcome, for the time being, we are doing HCG triggering, so modified natural cycle, to try a little bit to take care of that um, insecurity about the timing of the transfer. So for the time being, this is what we're doing, although as I said, uh, I agree with, with respect to possible what's optimal. We have not across the board done the, um, the aspirin treatment yet. We are talking about it. I don't think it's widespread in the United States to use it. And my bottom line coming from sort of more of a 
researcher's point of view rather than a clinician is, I don't want to miss this opportunity to actually try to understand why this is happening. We talk about the corpus luteum and you know, we thought about relaxing or VGF. There's so much more to study there that we need to, to get to the bottom of this. And if we jump to some treatment and say, well, we know how to prevent preeclampsia by giving the, uh, the aspirin. That may be true, but I think we still think to th we need to think seriously about some prospective studies to actually look at why this is happening, not so much how to prevent it only. I, I think, hi, Christos. Hi. Is and it, uh, hi. Hi, Padma. Hi, Ariana. It's really great to be listening to everybody. I think this is a problem which uh, I'm also facing, you know, it's uh, because uh, it's so much easier doing a program cycle. You know, we run batches all over the country and we have nine centers. We also go to other centers to perform uh, IVF. So it becomes very difficult if we want to do natural cycle in those. So those places where we are producing providing the support for IVF, we are definitely doing program cycles. Only what we're doing is we are definitely uh, using 150 milligrams of aspirin is what we recommend to the patients as a preventive. The other thing that we are in my unit in Mumbai, I am trying to see that my older patients, if I can take them naturally, but then I warn them that, you know, anybody will be available to do the ET. As uh, Dr. Vallava said, you know, we have a life also so uh, you know uh, it's just that you have to get your patients used to multiple people they should be open to that concept that anybody can do ET but it's very very difficult natural cycle is out I mean I cannot cope with natural cycle in my practice so yes programmed uh, you know semi-programmed cycle as Christos was talking but majority of our cycles are programmed cycles and I'm just using very liberally the aspirin in my practice so about the aspirin then, Nandita, because that's uh, something that uh, yeah, you brought up uh, towards the end of the presentation. I was perhaps expecting um, some studies. So do, do, are you aware of any studies for the implementation of aspirin in prevention of uh, preeclampsia or, or hypertension in pregnancies? Yeah, in fact, uh, I don't know the name of the I mean, the exact study or whatever, but what study which I have read is that if you give 75 milligrams of aspirin, it is preventive, but 30% develop uh, uh, in uh, what is, my God, I can't get the resistance to it. Okay, so that's why now the RCOG recommends 150 milligrams of aspirin to prevent preeclampsia. So if you have your first trimester markers, you know, the dual marker plus is what we call it here. Uh, then we do the Doppler, color Dopplers in the first trimester. And if those come in a normal pregnancy also with the high risk factors that are there, there's a lovely prediction model of uh, preeclampsia, which the gestosis uh, has come up with and uh, you can I think every patient needs 150 milligrams because any young patient first time pregnancy these are all the risk factors of preeclampsia so I don't know whether we are really adding to that so if I'm getting and my problem is also results see I'm getting fabulous results with program cycles I don't want to shift over majorly to get my results also affected and Christos is lucky you know they work in an environment which is research oriented and you are putting in two arms and all, where I am working, I have, you know, it's difficult to do that. It's really been difficult. Probably I'm not trained. I need to come to Christos and take some training, you know, uh, and, uh, <laughs> really, I mean, to be able to divide the patients and do it and check it out. So I think that's so important. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> so it's really, uh, this is the whole situation. I give all yeah. my... Thank yeah. you very much, um, Catherine. Me... Yeah, Sarah, yeah, if you want I'd to like comment to on this. Yeah, thanks, Ariana. I did not say anything about aspirin because I was thinking, I mean, aspirin uh, is, of course, used as a prophylactic against preeclampsia, of course, but uh, this is mostly once the patient gets pregnant because there have been so many studies on aspirin in IVF. It does not do any difference at this stage. So it makes sense once your patient is pregnant already yeah. to start aspirin right away after the pregnancy test. But before that, I really don't 
I mean, it's not been shown to do anything. Nothing before. It's all yeah. the first yeah. trimester. Before 14, exactly. you should give it. Oh, exactly, exactly. And then in high-risk pregnancies, of yeah. course, you should do the low molecular weight. Uh, you know the heparin and stuff. So, but uh, but that's that's obstetrics already and not IVF treatment. This was a very good question. Huh? It really mm -hmm. brought forward a lot of thought processes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, thank you. That's very very interesting. I think we, we did add a little bit more on the man management of these patients. And um, so, my second um, topic. I know you all touched on, on on this a little bit also yesterday. Is the day three versus day five versus day seven, day six, all sort of days. Now, I I know from my talks, personal talks with with, with Sarah, with all the Northern European colleagues, that they are very conservatives under this point of view, and they prefer to transfer day three embryos because there is less exposure to culture, media, to conditions and um, even when they do have an elective single embryo transfer. So I wanted to just, if you, uh, every, each of you can um, maybe explain a little bit more details to the audience. Um, do, do you think uh, an, an embryo uh, exposed up to day six or day five in culture media could have uh, an increased risk eventually in terms of epigenetic, in terms of um, long-term outcomes on the baby comparing to an embryo um, uh, transfer on day three. We're talking about frozen, obviously. Um, yeah, well, yeah, because yeah, I answer first because you said about the conservatives of the northern, northern European countries. This is absolutely true because, uh, you know, once a system, you have a system which works and you think that it works well, then there is uh, quite a lot of pressure against uh, making changes in it. But I should say that uh, day five uh, embryo transfer is becoming more and more of a re reality. Uh, the changes we are seeing, which we still are not publishing about, is that uh, the amount of uh, frozen embryo transfer is getting down uh, and the success rates are not going down. Um, and, uh, and, and that's about it. Of course, this is such a multifactorial analysis that uh, we can talk for days about this. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of epigenetic changes, uh, there, there have been some studies showing, uh, I cannot say that, well, there have been quite a lot of studies showing that um, the epigenetic changes which are observed uh, uh, in children born after IVF, they disappear little by little as time goes on. So in the long run, does it make any difference if you come, if you originate in a day three embryo, day three transfer embryo, day five transfer embryo, probably it will matter during pregnancy a little bit maybe, but maybe not later. I think twinning is a more of a problem, a monozygotic twinning, but the epigenetic changes, I don't really, I don't really think it is a much, of, much of a concern. I am not as ready to give an answer to this question mm -hmm. to be that definitive. Um, we have been studying actually genetic uh, changes in IVF children for now over 10 years. Uh, and we are now following some of these children as they grow up to see if there are any differences in how they develop. And uh, there's no question that some epigenetic marks that are present, let's say, at birth, basically the, 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 the child, as they grow up, those marks basically assume uh, their normal um, density, let's call it. Having said that, there are some and that's if there is one message that I would like to give the group is there are some which we've been calling susceptible individuals, let's say susceptible embryos, that this correction is not happening and we don't know the basis for it. So I am not ready today to give you an answer. I'm not worried about it or, or I'm really worried about it. I'm somewhere in the middle. I think the majority of kids probably we don't need to worry about. However, there may be a subgroup that makes them more susceptible to these epigenetic changes, whether it's freezing, whether it's prolonged culture, whether it's a biopsy, and we will have to see. This is exactly what we are studying. We have proposed it, we have a big NIH grant, and that's what we are studying. We are looking at birth, but also we are looking at 10 years plus after birth and having started these studies more than 10 years ago, some of the babies, we have their epigenetic fingerprint at birth. Now they are 10, 12 years old. And of course, 
less than that. And we're bringing them back to see which ones have changed, which ones have not, their epigenetic signatures, and most importantly, how they have done health-wise, how they have done in terms of their growth. Have they developed uh, diabetes? Have they uh, had problems with, it could be small for gestational age at birth, and then they become uh, uh, obese later on. This is what we're looking at. I don't have an answer though. But the important message for our audience is that the majority of the kids, of the offspring, are probably fine on the, from the epigenetics point of view. <clears throat> but there is a subgroup, which to date we cannot identify, but that's what we are working on to try at birth to identify the ones who are susceptible. Or even if I, I'm allowed to dream, if we know the paternal, sorry, the parental uh, <laughs> genetics, the parental genetics, which are the ones that maybe the offspring uh, are deemed to be more susceptible. We'll see. Thank you. I think, Ariana, my answer to that question is we are doing a lot more blastocyst transfer, single embryo transfers. But, um, you know, in, in India, the problem is the diversity. Uh, there are so many uh, centers, there are so many uh, uh, IVF centers where the laboratory may not be standardized. That is my worry also. So then in those cases, I think a day three transfer where we are subjecting it to lesser of the external environment, you know, the culture medias, etc. I think that would really uh, help with uh, it. But otherwise, I totally agree with Christos that, you know, <clears throat> there must be some factors which we can identify saying that this subgroup is more, uh, you know, uh, susceptible to epigenetic damage caused by the extended culture. Thank you. I think it's very important to give out this message. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Christos, for, uh, for your clear message. I think at the end of this masterclass, it's important that the audience go home with a clear message and a little bit of uh, reinsurance in a way. And so I'll, I'll hand over my co-chair for the final remarks. Thank you. Thank you. I think the three speakers have uh, very beautifully addressed the concerns of uh, perinatal issues uh, with uh, frozen embryo transfer and uh, you know concerns with uh, spontaneous cycles versus uh, uh, programmed cycles and the practical issues associated with the um, you know frozen embryo transfers in spontaneous cycles and uh, you know also as you know even if uh, women are uh, ovulatory maybe as they are uh, older we may have subtle ovulatory disturbances so all these issues need to be addressed before we move on to happily uh, spontaneous cycle uh, frozen embryo transfers. And uh, I really thank all the uh, speakers and my co-chair Ariana for uh, conducting this uh, um, session seamlessly and imparting with all very important and uh, current uh, evidence to all the audience. Thank you. And I thank uh, on, both, uh, on behalf of both of us, Dr. Durusha and her team for giving us this opportunity to chair this session. Thank you.